Hello, everyone. Okay. I'm trying to get comfortable first before I start. Um, I'm excited to be here today uh, because I was almost not going to make it. And um, I mean, visa issues, basically. I'm, I'm tempted to talk about that story, the opaque processes of visa application, lessons for civic tech. You know, I, I, I've thought about it. It would have been very interesting. But I'm going to stick to my presentation. Uh, I am Nonso Jidelfo, as he introduced me. Um, I have experience using design research and user-centered design for transparency and accountability programs and projects. And I work at the Engine Room. Uh, at the Engine Room, we help our partners make the most of data and technology. So today, I'm basically going to be talking about how we did that in, in Syria alone, right? Okay. So it's, it's a two-part presentation, basically. Um, and the first part, I, I'm going to talk to you about how we scoped the role of tech in our project. Uh, and then the second part is how working with technology impacts you as an implementer, right? It's more of a personal reflection. Don't worry, it's not going to get rigorous. <laughs> uh, okay. A bit of context. Um, because I'm short on time, I'm not going to like dive in too deep. But in Syria alone, there is high availability of water resources but there is like critically low access to potable water. Like it's at a critical level. Um, and there is a report on this link that kind of gives you a lot more insight into that story. But this was the problem that we we're trying to address, you know. And uh, the, the rest of this presentation is kind of how we went about it and trying to use technology to bridge this gap between um, high availability and low access. OK. So you can think of it as some sort of theory of change. Uh, you, you, you first encounter the problem, and then you need to get to a point where you find out how technology can help you address that problem. So it's a two-part situation. Uh, it's a two part, uh, it's a, there's a, there are two parts to it. So there's first you doing some sort of situational analysis, and then from there on you go on to like making your inputs. But you need to first understand the situation. Uh, and what we did, even though we had a sense of what the problem was, was starting to first understand how the affected populations described the problem itself, right? So we knew that there was a gap between um, there was low access to water, right? Potable water. But how, how do the people who are affected by it directly talk about it? And these are some of the examples that we found. The first test says that um, water availability is sparse, but also unpredictable, right? So it wasn't just that there was low availability of low access to water, sorry, not availability. It wasn't just that there was low access to potable water, but also it, it was um, unpredictable, right? Even if you, even if water, it, it would have been a better experience by the people who were affected if they knew that um, every Monday at 10 a.m. I could get water, right? And I can get like um, a liter of water and I need to figure out, you know, what I do with that. But the situation is that you do not know when water is going to come um, even, and you already know that water is like scarce, right? So uh, the, the other thing, too, was that water was a very political, um, water is political basically in Syria alone, right? Uh, because the politicians kind of pushed that forward as a potential fix that they would bring if they are elected. And then the people who, the, the, the population also think of it as a point of demand, something that they can ask of the government or people who are like, um, who have like high political interest, so they, they tend to ask for it. Um, there was also just like difficulty connecting quality to what you pay, right? You, you, you think by default because I get to pay for water, it should be clean water, but it wasn't a given. Um, and then there was like 
the disconnect between the service delivery guys and the, 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 pop, the affected population. So these are like key examples of how the, the people in the context were describing the problem different from how we understood it. And I, I, this, this was kind of critical for us to get to before we started talking about how to include technology. The next thing that we did was to um, figure out, given those problems, how is the affected population trying to address it, right? So they, all, they already had their own ways of like dealing with these issues. They weren't like sitting and folding their arms. So specific to the one around um, availability and low access, sorry, uh, um, low access as well as uh, unpredictability, they, um, they had things like having the phone number of like the tap manager or like um, people like setting alarm clocks to be able to wake up at 2 a.m. and check like if the water, you know, was running and stuff like that. I'm not gonna go through the rest. But these were like two first critical steps that we took before we got to um, the third question, which is what incremental improvement can be made to tackle the problem, right? We weren't gonna try and address the problem st starting too far from how the people in the context were already trying to address it. That was kind of one, one decision that we made. Um, the second decision was also thinking about our resource, right? And sometimes when you think about resource, it, it, it's, not only, it's not only things like financial, but it's also like the te technological capabilities of maybe your team and the affected population, right? So those were like resource considerations that we made in trying to get to what tech could do. Um, and it was only then that we started asking the, the specific te technology question. So what tech solution should we implement in this scenario? Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is kind of embedded in our design research process. And um, it took me just like trying to think about what we went through to like pull this out. So I'm happy to like get reactions to the thought process. All right, so but the, I think the other specific thing that we made sure in when we started, when we got to saying, okay, what can tech do? We are also thinking that we should make sure it doesn't distort the meaning of the problem to the affected population. So that at the point where you start introducing technology, you are first not introducing a new kind of problem. You know, you need to make sure of that. And um, also, we also wanted to think about like, you know, what, what was gonna be the cost of, of introducing technology at this point in time. All right. So sometimes we dream of this tech outcome, uh, but yeah, maybe this is something we just get, right? Tables and chairs are also technology at some point in, in, our, in human history. All right. So the, the second part of this presentation is about the impact of technology. Um, and specifically on implementers. So I imagine that this room is filled with like, you know, very smart uh, <laughs> implementers of civic tech um, or technology in general, so. Okay, in, in, in getting into the impact of tech, there was a, there was, there's some sort of like backstory to it. Before we partnered with Code for Sierra Leone, who, who is the partner we were working with to, on this project, they had already um, taken on this problem. In trying, they had made efforts to address this problem, and they had gone about it with one specific approach. Um, they, they did a hackathon, right? And this impact story is my personal reflection on the trade-offs, you know, in the first approach that was seeking to address in this problem and uh, the second approach. So like a hackathon and a design research process. And it's, it's good for you to note that this isn't a comparison. Um, yeah, it isn't a comparison, but it's more of like the trade-offs because it's, uh, they're, they're two very different things, right? It's like apples and oranges. I think because we do not compare apples and oranges doesn't mean we cannot talk about both of them at the same time, right? Okay. So if, if, the, if the process above kind of depicts how you get to you know, tech development, you would see that design research is you know, a very limited part of that process, right? 
you would you would do you would and, and it's something that's going to you know consume your time a lot. It's like painstaking time invested in trying to get to design research, and it only gets you gets you through one part of the process to involving technology in your project. But the hackathon is um, is more of a compressed process of the first three uh, you know stages of this entire process. You know, it's it kind of brings it all together and very quickly. Um, and there's the, there's a potential also that with the hackathon, you might be, you might be, um, you might have included some amount of research, you know, before you like you know went into other other stages like the design and development steps in the hackathon, but there are chances that it, it may not have been design research, maybe other kinds of research is you know how you got to that, but yeah, this kind of overlap may be good for you to like you know have a sense of. Um, the other thing I want to talk about in the reflections were like the trade-offs, right? So the the experience was one in such that it felt like if you were going for deeper evidence, then you'd be confronted with less time, right? In a, in a hackathon situation, you might not have the time to like generate as much deep evidence as you need. But also, if you turn to design research, there might be so little time for you to you know, do it in a very rigorous way that kind of helps inform your project. So these were some of the trade-offs. The second trade-off there is like, one of these approaches kind of helped us achieve greater functionality. So there were like a lot more things we could do with technology through the hackathon process. Um, but with the design research, it seemed like we're moving to the other end of the spectrum where it was like more usability, you know. Um, this is kind of a cool one for me. Uh, it did feel like one of these approaches kind of helps you get stakeholders buy-in because of um, the, kind of out, the kind of outcomes or yeah, the, out, the things you kind of create out of it. So the hackathon process can very quickly get you like a lot of stakeholders to get bought into your process. Um, it, is, it is something that is easy to pitch, you know, and people can quickly get carried along on it. Um, but if you move to the other end of, the, of this, my imaginary spectrum where there is design research, you probably will be achieving more of um, stakeholders co-creation, right? And that's like a, a very tough thing to do, you know. I mean, co-creation is like the, some sort of developing alongside with everyone, you know, being able to pull them along, it's, it's not that easy a process. Yeah, okay. So the, the, the hackathon was also good for like stimulating the ecosystem because you could bring together multiple types of actors who are thinking about the same problem. They, they weren't all, they were, they, in all cases, they were not all technologists. So they were just like people who are interested in policy, people who are like, who, who, are, who are researchers, academics, right? Or who, who have experienced this problem and have ideas on how it can be resolved, right? So the, the hackathon puts you in a situation where you're like stimulating the ecosystem very quickly, like because you bring all these actors together, they get an opportunity to interact. Um, but with the design research process, you're more just focusing on studying the ecosystem. And uh, there might not be a lot of stimulation like, you know, done to that ecosystem. The last piece of reflection from you know having done these two approaches is what I kind of refer to as the implementer's journey. Let me take a breath. <laughs> um, so if this graph kind of represents how complexity change, changes over time, um, the, 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 the line on it will be you moving from a very undiagnosed problem towards making impact, right? So undiagnosed in the sense that you don't understand the problem. And then as your understanding of a problem increases and your ability to address it, you start you know, moving down towards impact. And then this is like the, the, the time axis for you. And if you, 
if you, th if you think of the beginning of the line as where you kind of insert your research, and, and in my case, design research, um, it's like, and it doesn't like start at the tip of at the tip of the axis because there, there might have been some you know initial understanding of the situation, but you're not so clear, and you begin to execute your design research process, and you gradually like you know you descend in complexity, and you get to a point where you can finally say, um, you know what, I can start building something, and um, you initiate you know your prototyping you know game, and that begins to happen. Uh, and finally, at some point, you feel like I have a good prototype, uh, and um, you say, "Okay, let's start implementing the project." So we didn't we didn't just like kick off right away, say we're implementing the, the specific project or the idea, but we kind of went through that part. Um, and then finally, like post the prototyping and implementation, you get to where you are now doing the tech design. Where it, get, where it gets interesting with the wavy line, I didn't have a better way of describing that, is because sometimes you're now like, you're clearly, you're clearly in the zone of impact, right? But you're not making impact yet. Um, so sometimes you feel like you, you got it right, and you get like user feedback, you know, results, you do your M and E, I don't know how to do that very well. Um, and then you kind of, it drops again, you feel like, oh, I need to iterate. And you, you continue down that spiral till you get to some point in time where you are able to make impact. But it doesn't just happen immediately. <sighs> All right. Um, so here's my take on, on, on this. Uh, it is that when we think about technology in the way that we are naturally drawn to because of the, the prowess and the power of the solutions that we have, are able to create, it, we, 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 we take the risk of undermining our critical thinking capabilities or our problem solving skills, right? So we need to be careful about that. Um, so where then should you begin to think about technology in your project? Um, I can tell you when not to, but I might not be able to tell you when to, right? You should be able to use your personal discretion as to when to, but when not to, I strongly think it's when the problem is too complex or when the solution is too complex. Those are two times where you should not be thinking of involving technology. All right, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation.